John Torpy has been making Hurleys since the 1950s. From his base in East Clare, he manufactures between 50 and 60,000 of the country's finest Hurleys every year. Along with his son Sean and a full-time team of six, he ensures the quality of his product is of the highest standard by overseeing every step of the hurley making process. It is a process he has perfected over 50 years. My uncle Paddy made his own hurleys and so uh, I would watch him making his hurleys and spoke shape, bit of glass for finishing and so I got a love for it and I would go and cut my own small roots and make my hurleys, chipping away with a little axe. As with most things, the best place to start is at the beginning. For John Torpy, that's in the forest. It takes ash to make hobbies, and it takes good ash trees to make good hobbies. When you're cutting a root, once you know what to look for, you can be sure that the holly that's going to come out of it is going to be a top quality holly. If you have too many roots in a tree and you haven't enough room for the handle, then you have to throw away a lot of it. So three roots, three good big roots, at right angles to each other is the ideal tree. Despite growing 40 acres of ash on his own land, John's selection criteria are so strict that he has to source a large amount of his timber from overseas. I was searching the country looking for wood and I couldn't find it. A guy phoned me uh, who was in Holland and he said there was brilliant ash there and would I go over and look at it? And I got in a flight. I went over to look at it, I cut uh, two logs in the wood myself, shipped them back here, got a few of the clear haulers to use them at the time, and sure, straight away we knew they were absolutely brilliant. And so this is my 11th year in that country cutting ash. With the timber now acquired, it's off to the sawmill. Another vital step in the production of a quality hurley. When you take it to the sawmill and you cut away the first slab, you will see the grain immediately and you'll know, you'll know that, it's, that you've made the right decision. You know? And then it's a matter of uh, getting to know how to cut that log so that you will maximise the number of planks and that you will have uh, the straightest grain. Because if you cross the grain, if you don't level your, your log uh, in the proper way, you'll cut across the grain and the first slash, naturally the hurley is going to break. The planks that are cut by the sawmiller are now stacked and left to dry and season for at least six months. The next step is to mark the seasoned boards. A skilled marker makes sure the pattern of the hurley runs perfectly with the grain, ensuring a strong hurley will be cut from the board. The boards are cut using the bandsaw. The familiar shape of a torpy hurley is now becoming obvious. It is at this point that two different systems are used to finish the hurleys. Some sticks, such as goalkeeper's hurleys, special orders and big boss hurleys are finished by hand in the workshop. Others are taken to the state-of-the-art machines to be completed. This machine shapes the hurleys from the boards. It can make four units simultaneously, allowing torpy hurleys to make enough sticks to meet the demand from their satisfied customers. From here, the hurleys are taken to the sander, where the skilled team sand them down and make sure the finish of the hurleys is to the standard expected of a torpy hurley. The hurleys are stamped with the torpy hurley seal of approval. They are packaged and ready for shipping. <laughs> torpy hurleys have been used by some of the great names in hurling. Davy Fitzgerald, Brian Lohan and the Clare team of the 90s became legends of the game. They made history by winning three Munster titles and two All-Irelands. Davy, amongst others, never took to the field with anything other than a hurley from John Torpy. I've been using Torpy hurleys for a long number of years now, I suppose. As long as I played for Clare, I was using Torpy hurleys. And um, it's funny um, when you get a feel for something and something that's good, you can't go away for it. And I suppose the one thing that I found good is that, and was very important, that all the feel, all the weight, all the shape of my hurdles is always the same. Um, I think that's vital in anything you do. If you're not happy with the feel of your hurley, you're in trouble. And no matter how good you train or what you do, 
if the thing you have in your hand isn't right, you're wasting your time. And that's that's a hundred percent the reason why I kept using John's hurlies is always the same. You can talk to John and he's willing to to listen to what is good for you at the same time, like you know, and that's I think very important. Probably I don't know what other guys do or what the story is, but I just know that if I need a small tweak here or there, it can be done, and that's very important to me. So it was, and that's why I used them for so long and never tried anything else when, when I was playing with Clare. Hurleys like Davies that are finished by hand are a real labour of love for John Torpy. After we've marked it, uh, it's shaped on the bandsaw. And then I take an electric hand planer because naturally with the number I do now, you would never be able to do them in the old way with a hatchet and a spoke shape. And I plane down both sides evenly. I must take the right amount from each side. Um, <clears throat> when I have it taken down sufficiently, uh, that you know, it wouldn't be prudent to take any more because one slip and you'll have a, a nice piece of ash to slide. I go to the spoke chef to round off all the edges that the planer has left square. So the spoke chef <clears throat> is one of the best tools, I suppose, that was ever because you can do all the sanding in the world and it will not give you a balance in a hurley like a spoke chef will do. And if, you, if you're able to use a spoke chef efficiently, it's one of the best tools you can have. So I round off all the, all the edges with the spoke chef and then a very important part is the toe for lifting the ball. Has to be taken down exactly the right amount. But remember, you're cutting across the grain, so you need absolute sharpness on your spoke chef for doing that. From the bench, John takes the hurley to the workshop. And as with the machined hurleys, sands and finishes the hurley until he is satisfied to put his name on it. But when you're dealing with individually prepared hurleys, that may not be the end of the story. If the customer, when he calls, says, uh, John, maybe uh, you might, it might, it's a little bit heavy, I can take it back, spoke chef, Two minutes, and it's totally better. After 50 years of making hurleys, what drives John Torpy to continue? Having great hurlers uh, arriving at my workshop and looking for uh, a special type of hurley and making it for them is such a treat. To me, it's not, it's a pure labour of love, you know, when I see that happening. And... Uh, when the same guys keep coming back, and I often hear a reaction from people, oh, they're not breaking enough of them. I say, they're breaking too many. Because if somebody, if somebody doesn't break a hurley, he's going to tell somebody else where he got it. And so I'm back in business.